In August this year, we had to say goodbye to our family dog, Spike. We knew it was coming. I mean, he was really old and had a lot of health problems. I didn't say much about it to anyone except in my comic, which is where I normally share the things that I feel. And in the comic I posted was a drawing of us standing in the parking lot outside the veterinary hospital, and our son Dexter had Spike's leash. And that was about it. There was this picture of Spike that Dexter really wanted me to find from around the first year that we got him, so that he could put it into a frame and keep it. And as I was looking for that picture, I got a message on Instagram from a local artist here in Madison who had seen my comic. My name is Vicki Liu. I'm a fine artist, illustrator, and I'm also a web designer. She told me how she was really sorry about our dog and asked if I had a photo of him. And I told her that I was actually looking for that picture that my son wanted, so I shared it with her. Then the next day, she messaged me back on Instagram and told me that she had something she'd like to give me. By the way, did I mention that she actually paints portraits of pets? She sent me a picture, and it was a painting of our dog from that picture that I gave her. So let me put it this way. I basically lost it right there for about a good five minutes. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. Vicky did was just the nicest thing ever. I mean, I'm always surprised by the people that I meet on this show, and I'm so happy that I've gotten the opportunity to just become a part of this community of artists that I've met over the past couple of years. So I set up a time to meet with Vicky at my train car, and she was going to give me the painting of Spike that she did. Well, I mean, there was no way I wasn't going to sit down and talk with her on the show. The AC still wasn't hooked up on the train, so I set up a card table outside and some chairs, and we sat out front, and I got to know a little bit more about her and what she does. And I just want to say this openly. I want to thank you so much for doing the picture of our dog. That was the sweetest thing. It was my pleasure. (laughs) When I found out about your pupper, I have a particular, especially with people that, not just that I'm super close with, but people that I follow on Instagram, I follow a lot of like pet accounts, like people with their dogs and their cats. And uh, whenever I see like a post, it's like the pet crossed the rainbow bridge. My heart immediately sinks. And I'm like, okay, I know that there's nothing that can replace or help in that moment because, you know, you're going through so many things. It's so personal for everybody, but Having a portrait, mm-hmm. I feel, in some small way, helps capture a bit of, hopefully, the essence of that pet. And while it might be a little emotional, like it would be for me if I had lost my pet to have a portrait, so many people that I've done portraits for, it's not about the gratitude. It's about how you can just tell that it, it's it's done something. In yeah. some positive way, it's affected them. Most of the time, people are kind of like crying a little bit when they're talking about it, and I feel bad, and I'm like, I didn't mean to make you cry, but right. I understand that that's sometimes the natural reaction. So yeah. when I found out about your pup, it just mm. it got me, because I have two dogs that I rescued myself, mm. and I can't imagine. They're like, I don't have children. They're my babies. They're my they're my fur babies. So I just I dread the day. <laughs> can't get into that. I can't talk about Let's that. Not. We'll go past it. We can yes. it later. But, but I I appreciate that so much. Well. And uh, so how did you get into doing the pet portraits? You know, here's okay. This is actually I was thinking how did this happen because I'm such a serial dabbler. Like mm. I like doing so many different things. But I've, at heart, I've always been an illustrator and a painter. And having pets myself. I've always done portraits here and there just because I I genuinely love doing it because I love animals so much. One of my friends, Emily Balsley, I'm not sure if, I'm sure a lot of people who listen know who she is, but she's a wonderful um, graphic designer and illustrator here. And she told me about the 100 Day Project, which I was kind of like, ooh, okay, can I make that commitment? Um, Because I have a full-time job and then I pretty much, by the time I get home, I maybe work three to four hours a night on my artwork. And I thought, oh, can I commit to this? Can I do, like, and I knew I'd have to do 100 days straight. I couldn't just maybe do a little bit here, a little bit there. So I decided to do um, 100 days of mini, like they were two-inch by two-inch portraits of dogs. Yeah. And so I started doing those little itty-bitty watercolors, and I started getting, like, a lot of feedback from people going, oh, would you, these are so cute. Can you do one maybe of my dog? Could you do, you know, 
you know, I'm going to get a gift for a friend or something like that. And I thought, hmm, like people are really responding to this. And I just did it because, you know, it was part of the project and I enjoyed it. And so the response was actually very overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And so from there, I started doing larger portraits. Okay. I had more and more people coming to me and, and saying, hey, I saw mainly Instagram was kind of, you know, the thoroughfare where people found me. Before that, you weren't doing pet portraits or? I wasn't. No. Okay. I did a lot of like landscapes. I would do animal portraits here and there, but I did like landscapes, portraits of people, things like that. So I wasn't completely centered on pet portraits per se what I was thinking too is you went with the smaller one now it seems like that would be easier because you're going it's smaller it's easier it's not it's still the same concept it's not you know what this is what I I thought it would be easier Mm -hmm. but here's the thing when you're working so small you have to be so much more mindful Mm -hmm. of the little things that make that animal unique right like every every pet every animal they have like their little unique signature like look or you know Mm -hmm. the patterning and because you're not working in a large space where you can kind of get in there and tweak things and add more detail you have to really be good at being like retractive Mm -hmm. and so that actually that project helped me but it didn't it didn't go faster like I thought oh I can knock these out because I'm doing two inch by two inch little portraits and I'll just get them done and still putting the same amount of detail in there (laughs) I really was and then I was like let's do gold so then I I went on this passionate love affair with like gold ink and gold leaf and so now if you look at my work You'll see a lot of that now. Like, I use a lot of gold leafing and gilding and stuff. But it kind of started from that one project, like, two years back. So it's only been two years. It's only been two years, yeah. Okay. I was curious to know more about how Vicky started incorporating this gold ink into her work and why she decided to use it in the first place. Why did you start using the gold? I don't see a lot of that. So why is that? Here's the thing. When I was going to my ad, I was an illustration major. Okay. And I found that there was this kind of... I don't know how to put it, but there was kind of this like designers versus fine artists and you can't be one or the other, right? Like even in some of my fine art classes, my professors would be like, well, you have to pick, you have to pick. You're being a little bit too illustrative with your painting or your, and so I found that that was very odd to have to be so restrictive, right? And I thought with illustration, does that matter how you're approaching things with like medium and, Mm -hmm. and stuff like that? And so needless to say, I ended up leaving there and I ended up getting my BFA um, at UW Oshkosh. But when I started incorporating geometry into my work, and so here and there, ever since I graduated, I would do pieces where I would put patterns and stuff like that in there. And Gold Leaf started when I was doing those portraits and I was using calligraphers gold ink. I thought, well, how can I frame a portrait and not just have like a dog or a cat like right in the middle and there's nothing there to anchor it like it's just kind of floating and I didn't want that and I thought well the best way to anchor it is to let's think about borders let's let's see how we can make this interesting so that's when I started incorporating maybe six months after I was doing the the 100 day project Mm -hmm. I was doing bigger pieces and so then I was adding gilding at that point and Mm -hmm. at that point it was I was using composite gold leaf and now I'm using the more expensive the 24 karat gold leaf Mm -hmm. and that was Yeah, it was a recommendation from an artist who streams on Twitch. And so every once in a while, I do that as well. You actually went with the Twitch channel. I went with the Twitch channel. And so I wish I could say that I was more consistent with it. It's maybe once a week right now. I met an artist called Nen, and she does like comic book covers and stuff like Mm -hmm. that for like Titan, things like that. And she said, you know what? The issue with with gilding, like as far as adhering, because I would find I would lay like down the medium and then it just wasn't coming up and pulling as easily as I wanted it to. And she says, don't do the composite. It's obviously, it's like aluminum. It's like all of this. She goes, go for the the 24 karat. You're going to use less of it and you're not going to have to struggle with it. It, The the application is going to be a lot easier. And I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. And I couldn't go back after that. Like it was so much more easy to apply and it adds warmth to the portrait. Like I rambled because this is what I do. But um, (laughs) actually that's very handy for a Twitch channel, you know, Oh, sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes I get so focused though when I'm doing that, like I'm not looking up at the the chat sometimes. So it's the trying to be better at like doing multiple things and multitasking but don't you do like the bob ross thing where you just talk Uh, about what you're doing like i mean that sometimes but i think a lot of you get a lot of like 
repeat people that come to your channel. And a lot of them already kind of know the spiel. So we end up talking about just random oh, topics and not yeah. so much the, the work, but you do get people who come in every once in a while and they're asking you what kind of mediums you use, what kind of, you know, if it's a different types of substrates or whatever. Like I work on a lot of different types of, of things, different types of papers. And mm -hmm. like Duralar is an interesting kind of like a, a plastic film that you can paint on both sides and oh. an artist that I really like Scott Fisher does that and okay. so I follow him and he does some amazing work mm. so yeah I'm kind of like where you see like glitter and you're like ooh, that's like me right. when I see artists working on new materials I'm like oh I have to try it oh, see like course. how can I apply it to my work Vicky ships a lot of the paintings that she does and not just in the US but internationally I wondered what she learned from that and what her method of doing it was and if it involved like a lot of trial and error until she got it right. I did a portrait for somebody in Australia. And so this was winter and it was summer for them. Yeah. So I had shipped out a portrait that had, a, it was a pretty solid, like kind of, I'd like to do these kind of halos around some of, of the portraits that I do. And it was, there was a lot of gold leaf. And I sent it to the wonderful lady and she messaged me back and said, I love the portrait. It's really great. But I noticed in some parts of the gold leafing, like it looked like it, it pulled up. So Ooh. when you're putting it in a, like a sleeve and you're putting it in the cardboard, you have that like sturdy backing. I had all of that. I had everything. So it was weatherproof. But what I didn't think it was with the heat, with the shipping, with things being compressed, mm. that that gold leaf would be right up against that plastic. And in that heat, when you're pulling that plastic back, it would pull the leafing. Yeah. So I learned now to use something called glassine, which is kind of like a wax type paper. So I put a sheet of that over the gold leaf now. Oh. And so that will never, nothing will stick to it. Okay. So it was lesson learned. I ended up doing another portrait for her. I felt bad. So I did a second portrait for her, which she didn't ask for, but I felt bad, you know, and it was right. a lesson learned. I get that. And yeah. so now I'm like, now I know that when I'm using the leafing, especially with the 24 karat, that it's a very delicate, soft metal. How did you discover that solution? You know what? I Googled it. Okay. I think I Googled it and it was like, what kind of film to put over gold leaf so that you don't have adhesion? And apparently this is a pretty big it's... problem that people have run into that I wasn't aware of because yeah. I was shipping domestically. And so I wasn't really having any issues. It wasn't weeks where something was out wherever things end up being planes and ships or whatever. So um, that I learned through international shipping. Do you ship a lot? I do. I do. I try to keep things a little bit more domestic just because a lot of times I will admit that I, I usually end up eating the cost of shipping. So mm. when I usually give like a, a quote for a piece, typically because for a domestic, I say free shipping. For a while I was doing that for <laughs> international <laughs> and that was a little spendy. You didn't know that. Yeah, I think if this were like my lifeblood, if this was what I was doing for my career, which I'm hoping that I'm, I'm slowly working towards that, I'm more mindful now. How are these people finding you, even like the international? Is it just through Instagram or? Through Instagram. Okay. Really, I am a really poor marketer. I admit this. I'm great at getting the work done. Mm -hmm. I have so much work. If you could see, I have a room in our house. That's my studio. Mm -hmm. I have so much work, it's ridiculous. Like, because I can't not create, right? Like, I can't, it's like, it's my way of unwinding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people might watch a reality TV show or whatever, and I will go home and go to my studio and I'm painting or, or drawing or doing something. And it's not always for others. A lot of times it's my own personal thing. And, and I'm just posting a lot. So I think a lot of it is just like, almost every day I'm posting work on Instagram, I have my website posted on there. I would say maybe 20% of the commissions I get is from my website. A great majority of it is just Instagram and word of mouth. People who get a portrait and then they say, oh, my cousin or oh, my sister or my brother. And that snowballs. So I really haven't had to do a lot of marketing. It's okay. kind of sold itself, which is kind of interesting. I really didn't expect that. And I really wasn't planning on when I was doing these portraits of doing commissioned work. I just, it never really occurred to me to do something like that. So it became what it is now. And now it's amazing. Last winter, I thought, oh, I'll open myself up for commissions officially and I'll post it on Instagram and let yeah. people know. And I was like, I'm just going to do 10. I'm going to mm -hmm. do 10. And, and I was overwhelmed. I got like 
I, it was at least 40 within the first 48 hours Whoa. I had people. And I was like, okay, so this is like a thing. Like this could be a sustainable form of income and work and, and things like that. So yeah. Huh. Yeah. It, it's noble. But I would say Instagram's the main platform. I've found that recently too. And a lot of it does have to do with the fact that you're being consistent. It's not just like, here's my website and here are the same pictures that are here all the time. You're doing things and you're being out there and interacting, you know? I'm interacting and you know, I think that there's there's always this debate of do you do one thing, do you hyper focus on it, and then people mm-hmm. know you for that one thing, and then that's how you start building air quotes like a brand. <laughs> and so I never really thought about branding. I just thought, well, I'm an artist. I like doing all sorts of different subject matter. But at the end of the day, I always found myself doing pet portraits. And so mm-hmm. I thought, for me, it's not about any of the money obviously because look at free shipping here like it's just because I I genuinely love doing it because I love animals so much and so a lot of times I have a lot of people come back and say that they they can tell in some way and Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure how but that means a lot to me feel like you kind of owe all that to Emily telling you to do the 100 day (laughs) challenge I would I absolutely think you're you are absolutely right yep thank you Emily (laughs) big shout out to Emily Balsley there She's great. Had her on the show before. If you haven't heard that episode after this, go listen to it. It's a great interview. Vicky had just started making the jump into painting on her computer. Like I actually saw some digital paintings that she posted on Instagram right before we met. And since most of the work I do is either on a tablet or on my phone, she asked about my experience doing it. What do you use when you're doing your, if you don't mind my asking, and I'm asking because I just started you just started drawing digitals, yes. like last night. Yeah. I was procrastinating, 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 terrified. Mm-hmm. There's something so secure to me about having my paintbrush and my paints. Mm-hmm. And I've had an iPad Pro and Procreate. I've had the, I've had everything there. And it's just like I would look at my iPad and be like, eh, not tonight. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it was. But so I admire you're working uh, digitally or are you using like Photoshop? What are you using? First, I will say the secret at first is download Every drawing app that you think you should be using or that people are recommending and just try them all. Just have them all ready. Like, that's what I did. And then I decided on one. But there are things where, so the best way to explain it is like when you're doing graphic design, you know how it's like, okay, I'll do this vector in Illustrator, but then I'm going to move it over to Photoshop because it has the brush I want. So I have a couple of programs that I kept around because I can kind of use them for one thing and then move them over. The one that I use the most is actually one that's meant for comics, and it's called... So this whole story becomes kind of a... But I used one that was for comics anyway. (laughs) It's called Medibang Paint, and it's a free program. It's really good. It's got a lot of the stuff that I need in it, but my favorite one that I use, is it's so simple and so easy, and it's no layers, no frills. It has one of the best inking tools in it, Google Keep. The note-taking app. Really? I do half of my drawings in that. I don't do the comic in that, but I do half of my drawings in that, yeah. Although I will recommend you go with a stylus because drawing with your finger or whatever isn't going to... I have the Apple Pencil. Yeah. So I've had that thing, and it's seriously, I've had all the tools, and they've just been sitting there. Mm-hmm. And it's been daunting, and I don't know why. It's so weird because I, I dabble in so many things. Textiles, mm-hmm. I do like embroidery, I do a bunch of different things, but for some reason, the realm of digital was just like this thing that I was like, I don't know if I can, if I can do it. But last night I was like, no more, no more of this. No, I saw that what you were posting. I'm like, this is great. And the best part, and it's cool too, cause you're just doing the heads. And then the first thing you said was, I'm going to turn these into stickers. And it's like, of course you are. Yeah. Like there is this, there's this designer again on Twitch. I've, I've met so many interesting creators through Twitch, which for yeah. the longest time I had I didn't really even know about the platform as much as I knew people were gaming on it. There is such a rich and diverse creative community. Mm-hmm. And I have met so many. And the great thing about it is is it because it's streaming, because it's live, you have questions, go ahead and ask. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not afraid to ask questions about, you know, what is your process, what tools are you using, this and that. One of these designers that I follow was like, yeah, one of these brands, online sticker companies is having some kind of sale and blah, blah, blah. And so this was just like two days ago. And I thought, oh man, like maybe this is a time for me to get into digital. And it was Mm -hmm. like one of those get in now, you know, within 48 hours with the super deal or whatever. And I thought, well, oh my, I have two days, let's figure this out. (laughs) So that was like another thing that kind of kicked me in the pants to get me into Mm -hmm. digital. But yeah, I thought something simple. So I just did like little, uh, a Frenchie, a little 
little friend she had, yeah. And the funny thing is, is until I read the caption, didn't occur to me that it was a digital drawing. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, it's silly, because I'm looking at it again, I'm like, <laughs> duh, it totally is. But I like that you're doing that, I like that you're trying to, and it's no different than when you were saying, you know, I like to use this different paper, it's really the same thing, just different platform. You try out the different things, you try the different ways to do it. Like when I first started doing the tablet drawing, or I moved up from my phone to a tablet, because I needed a bigger space. Were I you still, doing this on your phone? I was doing it on my phone. Yeah. Huh. Well, because I never bring a sketchbook <laughs> with me. I always forget a sketchbook. So I have to learn, and I've gotten much better at it. And basically, it's the fact that you can zoom in as much as you want. Like, as you're sitting there going, oh, it's such a small area. It's like, oh, but I can just draw a section, zoom in on it. So. Just like with the iPad. Mm -hmm. You know, I can just really, like, hyper-focus into one area and then mm. pan out. That That is the beauty of those programs and, and things like that, yeah. And you'll notice when you go to do something organically... Sometimes you'll instantly want to do the uh, undo button yes. or you'll want to like, you know, yeah. zoom in on it. And it's like, I can't with this. So I'm like holding my head. I'm like, I've done that so many times. Where I was like, oh, I put that wash in too dark. Like, I'm not going to be able to pull that out of the paper. And then it's like, OK, maybe we'll add some gold leaf there. Uh -huh. So not that if anybody gets anything with gold leaf for me, that's a mistake. <laughs> like I'm covering it up with gold leaf. But I've totally been there where you want to yeah. like, where's the undo? The conversation kind of turned to the earliest memories that we've had about discovering art in a way that makes you think, I want to do this, like, all the time. I'd say my earliest memory, kindergarten, we had a, like, a crafting art station little thing. Your days would be broken up, and, and I remember having my, like, little apron on and, like, having, like, a little, I think it was probably, like, a styrofoam piece of a dish or, like, a plate or whatever, and we, like, put those finger paints in it, yeah. and I mixed red and white, and I made pink. And I was like, are you kidding? What these two colors make? And honestly, since that day, I can remember it clear as day. I was in love with art. Mm -hmm. I was, and that was it. Like that was it for me. And so from that point on, I had always drawn, I had always painted, but I mean, I was painting all through high school. Oh, man, I, I was doing so much work, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew that I liked doing it. I always wanted to, to illustrate children's books. I had grown up with like pop-up books yeah. and like, all of these really amazing books. A lot of them, my my uncle, when he would travel to Europe, he'd bring back a lot of, I think they were called Caldecott medal winning books, like for children's, like children's books, they would get like a, awards and stuff. And so he'd always bring back these like beautifully illustrated books. And I thought, oh man, one day I want to do that. So that's what I, that's why I decided, well, when I'm out of high school, I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, to college for illustration. And so sadly, that kind of, thing happened where it was like I had to do either or at least mm -hmm. in that particular environment and I was like I didn't want to have those constraints and and be confined to picking one side or the other design or fine art right. and so that's when I was like well I'm going to do fine art and like we're getting to the age where things like more digital was coming out and, and more things online and I thought I can I can do this and not have to worry about maybe necessarily getting a degree in this to do it. In high school, I always thought, well, you have to get a degree to do this. Like you can't just get get hired doing a job unless you have a degree in that particular field or something like that. And so, I, I'm not a youngin. I graduated in 2000, and that was right when the internet was starting to become a thing. So. Yeah. So then when I was in college, then I was seeing more and more of how the internet was impacting art and different things that you could do that wasn't necessarily something that you had to go to college or school for stuff like mm -hmm. that so I just found myself taking like a lot of workshops and a lot of things like that um, with different artists that I admired and and so that's that's kind of my work has evolved and progressed as my interests evolved and, and progressed and here we are that's the thing that surprises me you've mentioned a couple of times now that people have said you had to do one thing and it's your interests change and progress and you have several things it's just like saying that you're only allowed to like one kind of music you know, or it, people can like other kinds of art, but why can you only produce one kind of art? I think that's where it gets tricky. It was weird. I ran into that quite a few times. And then it's funny where we're at now, those parameters and those limits are just, p people don't talk about it anymore. Mm. But that, that was something that consistently over the span of maybe five, six years, I ran into a lot, which I thought was very interesting. I will say when I was getting my BFA, I had one particular instructor who sadly has since passed, but... He actually was like, if you, if you pick something, you don't necessarily have to pick one thing, but if you do whatever you do 
and you do it to the best of your ability and you just keep learning and mm-hmm. you just keep learning and you just keep introducing yourself to new things, you're going to do great. You're going to be successful. Yeah. Be consistent in what you're doing and it'll work out. You don't have to have all the answers right away. He uh, encouraged me to apply for this two students a year get this scholarship and he was like maybe you should apply for this and you can focus on a particular subject and series and you can kind of grow in in your skill set and Mm -hmm. and I was working in oils then too and I ended up getting it which was amazing and he had all the faith in the world that I was going to be able to achieve this thing and I thought oh "Oh, it's kind of selective and I kind (laughs) of look around and be like maybe some more you know people around me might be more worthy of it and he goes you have to get out of that mindset you have Mm -hmm. to get out of that mindset the comparison thing is going to kill any creativity it's going to kill your voice don't do it for some reason I just was kind of like well it's a nice idea but maybe it's for somebody else Mm -hmm. and so he kind of kicked my pants in that way and said you need to get out of that mindset and so I kind of just you know went for it and ended up getting that scholarship and created these big portraits of uh of people who are living with HIV AIDS, which was mm. something that was important to me because I lost my uncle to AIDS um, in 92 when it, people just, you didn't talk about it. And it was right. a very taboo thing. And so this was a very meaningful thing to me. And I was able to focus that whole summer uh, in between semesters on this series and wow. got to talk to a lot of amazing individuals that were that were living and thriving with, with HIV because at that point, there were so many more medicines and mm-hmm. things that people could live with it. Where more my uncle, that was just mm-hmm. it was a death sentence, and so it was very meaningful to me. And mm-hmm. and that all came about because I had this professor that was like, "You can do it. You're yeah. worthy of it, and you know, go for it." Over the summer, I've been moving more towards selling the things that I do online. And one of the options that seems really cool and easy to use is the store cart that is built into a Facebook page. So if you have a Facebook page, it's actually a cart right there, ready to use. I've tried it and it's kind of neat, but I've never actually sold anything on it. I saw that Vicky actually had one of hers set up and her stuff was available on Facebook using the cart feature. So I asked if she had any luck with it. I want to say you're the only other person I've noticed who's done this and I'd like to know if you had any success at it using the actual Facebook shop feature. I see that you have that set up. Has, have you ever, oh, you just did it. I just did it. And I will tell you, to be honest, I was hoping by setting this up that I'd be able to do it on Instagram mm. because they're one and the same. You have to get approved. You have to get approved. So the Facebook shop came up, which was not necessarily my intention to get that up. I was hoping that'd be something that I could integrate into my Instagram, but I haven't really done much with that. What are you using for selling your stuff online aside from the Facebook shop? So my website is WordPress, so I built it pretty much from the ground up and I'm using WooCommerce. And so I can marry the two. Okay. If you have your Instagram set up as a business account. And I do. And you do? I do. Okay. What I was told was that you needed to have a certain amount of followers in order to know. Kind of, kind of. There's a way around it. You need to integrate it, yes. But what you can do is when you create something and you have a business account on your Facebook account, you can create a boosted post of that painting, and then it will ask you, what do you want this to link to? So this is this is the way around integrating your shop. All you have to do is, because when you boost a post, through you can even do it through the Instagram app. Yeah it will say, where do you want this to link to? Right. And then you just go link to, and then you copy the URL to your the actual painting in your cart. And that oh. gives you the whole swipe up and the whole like featured, you know, in the feed link. Or is that in the actual Both. Post? You can do it in both. Oh. Yeah, you can do either one of those and you just do it in the Instagram app. So that's the way around it. So everybody's trying to connect their stuff, which is great because then you don't ever have to do what I'm talking about. But this way it's, yeah, you just, you can boost it for like a dollar for a day. I'm actually glad you told me this because for a while I was thinking of, is it Squarespace or Shopify or something? You Any can, you can, if you have that, you can instantly shop through your Instagram right. if you have one of those. I think it might be Shopify. And I thought, should I change the platform? And I thought, oh my gosh, all that work porting everything over. There's right. no way I'm going to do that. And so the Facebook thing kind of happened, but like I never quite found out how to marry that into Instagram. Mm-hmm. If you have a business account set, set up, it's much easier. Yeah. yeah. Look at this. <laughs> this is amazing. My mind is blown. Like after this, yeah. I'm really honestly going to try this. Yeah, no, you I'm should. really excited. You absolutely should. Vicky also has some new things that she's trying out, and one of them is something I was kind of surprised that she had never done before. I am doing my first market with One 1000, oh, yeah. trying to actually go out there mm-hmm. and actually 
you know, face to face people and, and sell my work. And so this is a huge thing for me because I've never done markets. I've never done like where I'm actually physically somewhere. It's always been online. And so Mm -hmm. you end up doing, it's very solitary as people know, like when you're a creator, a lot of times you're very much in your own world and you're not totally interacting with people a lot. And so I think after a lot of, I'll, I'll say kind badgering, um, <laughs> some people, you know, said, hey, like, apply for this. And, and Sarah over at 1-1000 is beautiful. She's wonderful. And mm-hmm. she was like, there's this beautiful thing, this new place, this new space that's opened up that we're going to be doing our holiday market at. It's a brand new venue. And I had been to the last couple because, you know, I, I like um, a lot of what 1-1000 does. And I'm part of their, I'm a member at 1-1000. And so I thought, well, this would be a a great time to start building up my work now for this because it's in the middle of December. And so that's what I'm doing. And so that's part of when I was working digitally and creating Mm -hmm. stickers. I'm thinking about like, what are some smaller little things that I could sell along with my portraits and stuff like that. And so this is going to be for me an exciting thing because I have to think about booth setup. I have to think Mm -hmm. about what work is going to speak to people and uh, I don't know, just, just have a go and see how, see what happens. And so it's a little scary for me, but it's good. It's a good scary. Again, I am just so touched by the painting of our dog Spike that Vicky made and love just doing this podcast and getting the chance to meet such great people. I've posted a picture of the painting that she made on this episode of the American Bandito website. You can go there and check it out. And if you want to see more of Vicky's work, visit her website at Vicky, V-I-C-K-I dash Lou, L-I-U dot com. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list and find links to all the other places that I'm at online. The music for this show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. And there is one more episode left this season of the show, so I hope to talk to you soon, and until the next time, so long. (laughs) 